Evet. Okay. Uh, let me stop your sharing for a minute so that we can uh, see everybody in one screen at the moment. Our live stream has started as well on Istanbul Aydın University Observatory account at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, Orhan Ajam, Carlos, Inna, hi. Un unmute yourselves, please, Mauricio. <laughs> There's something wrong with that microphone. Okay, okay now? <laughs> okay. Car Carlos has some uh, wind effects coming in. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but it's quite noisy. Yeah. 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 You're yeah. outside. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Carlos is a monster. <laughs> Better now? Better, yes, a little bit. Because I, I you need to mute. To mute the microphones. Let's mute the microphone microphones unless we speak. Let's have a quick chat before the uh, presentation. Okay, let me welcome, first of all, everyone in the second day of the fifth Azarkel school. Today and yesterday, we have been very busy with our um, astronomy lectures. You can see most of the board right now. Uh, on the YouTube channel, which is showing us right now in Istanbul Aydın University, observatory account, only the people who have their webcam open are seen, others are not seen. Uh, so uh, today and yesterday we have been very busy with the astronomy lectures and we are going to start the history of science lectures today in the evenings, uh, Istanbul evening. This is an e evening for Istanbul, but for many other people it might be different. For example, Professor uh, Nadir Al Bizri is going to uh, join us tonight, uh, and he's going to share his expertise on the optics of uh, Ibn Al Haytham. He is a professor from American University of Beirut, but he is now visiting Durham University. Welcome, Professor Nadir. Thank you very much. Uh... It's a great pleasure to be able to participate again in the Azarkil uh, School of Astronomy and also to be reunited with uh, old friends and making new friends. And it's, uh, uh, it's uh, also a, uh, an aspect in terms of your gathering where you accommodate the history of science. I find it very rewarding and it reflects also uh, the kind of experience that I have been having uh, at Durham University through the Leverhulme uh, Visiting Professorship this year, where my interactions have been with uh, physicists, mathematicians, theologians, philosophers, and historians. So this uh, reflects the kind of interdisciplinary character that now marks the kind of uh, directions we take in terms of our research. Uh, I'm going to share uh, the screen, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Please do. Yeah. Uh, 
because it gives us a sort of a context from which we yes. could, uh, embark on the theme of this uh, um, lecture. Uh, the focus will be on the science of optics of Ibn al-Haytham and uh, trying to also situate it uh, in the uh, historical milieu in which it emerged and also the impact and uh, adaptive assimilation of his tradition within the European uh, history of science and art. Um, to start with, uh, perhaps it would be a good idea just to introduce uh, Ibn al-Haytham from a biographical perspective. Uh, his full name is Al-Hasan Ibn al-Hasan Ibn al-Haytham, known in the Latin rendition of his name as Al-Hasan. He was born in Basra in 965, and at the time Basra was under Buyid and Abbasid uh, sovereignty. And he died in around 1041 in Cairo, which was at the time under the governance of the Fatimid uh, Caliphs. Uh, Ibn al-Haytham uh, was raised in a milieu that is quite uh, uh, marked by great interests in philosophy and the sciences already in Basra. So if he, we know around the time of his teenage years that within that city, there was a learned group uh, by the name of Ikhwan al-Safa, who were uh, proto-encyclopedists who engaged in the various mathematical, physical, psychological, and theological disciplines of that age uh, in the lineage of the Greco-Arabic traditions uh, of commentaries on figures such as uh, Euclid, Ptolemy, um, Aristotle, Plato, Archimedes, Apollonius of, of Perga. So in a sense, he was raised in a milieu that is quite intense in terms of the engagement with the sciences and the commentaries written on uh, the Greek corpus and trying to expand its applications into new sub branches uh, of knowledge. Uh, he developed uh, in his early career from what we could reconstitute around his biography, he developed a penchant towards the architectural arts uh, he was known by the, by the name Al-Muhandis, which designates the term of engineer or architect, but at the same time can also signify the geometer. And he also perfected his uh, understanding of uh, the arts of surveying and building construction, including some engagement with aspects that relate to hydraulics. And all of this was rooted on his reading and engagement with the mathematical disciplines and in particular uh, geometry. Having developed that kind of uh, persona, it is said that uh, perhaps the news uh, arrived uh, from Basra at the time to Cairo that there is this brilliant uh, architectural engineer who might have an idea about how to construct a water barrier that can control the ebb and flow of the Nile River which would be of great use for uh, Egypt, given that this great river is the uh, lifeline for the whole valley stretching from Nubia up to the Mediterranean. Um, it is said that uh, he moved or was lured to come from Basra to Cairo in view of inspecting the possibilities of establishing that water barrier or dam on the uh, Nile River. He was uh, commissioned to lead a, uh, a group of uh, engineers and surveyors uh, to inspect the banks of the river just to determine whether that project can be uh, realized and what kind of optimal sites can be uh, selected should such endeavor be acted upon. Um, after doing his uh, field work and survey, he came to the realization that that project cannot be realized. There's a hint in the uh, biobibliographical sources that report this narration around his life and works that uh, he came to the realization that this work cannot be uh, accomplished because uh, he saw the great ingenuity of the ancient Egyptians in terms of their uh, acumen and craft and skills in building construction. And he realized that uh, should that project could have been done, given the techniques that were available to him at his time, 
those ancient uh, Egyptians would have been capable of uh, erecting such water barrier. He returned with the news to the Fatimid court. Uh, and in a sense, it's an indication of a failure to uh, act upon a project that could have been very vital for Egypt. Soon he was decommissioned from his office as a chief engineer and pushed into an early retirement. And fearing over his life, he feigned madness. This episode happened actually under the Hakim Bi'amrillah, the Fatimid Caliph, um, based on sources that we have about the life of Ibn al-Haytham that come 200 years after the death of Ibn al-Haytham. So in a sense, it is still a, an area in historiography where there is debate over the narrations that surround the figure of Ibn al-Haytham and his life. But in a sense, out of this uh, uh, historiographic kind of uh, documentation, we could say that it was during the uh, period of the rule of Al-Hakim bi Amrullah when Ibn al-Haytham himself uh, feigned madness and was pushed to live in an apartment in the vicinities of the Azhar. And it is said that he resurfaced into public life after the death or according to the um, kind of mythical uh, narrations around the figure of Al-Hakam bi Amrullah, the disappearance of the Fatimid Caliph, because there are you know, some fascinating aspects associated with the Fatimid Caliph in the history of ideas in Islam that uh, can by themselves offer us a whole topic for a lecture. So it was around 1021 when uh, Al-Hakam bi Amrullah died, and it was uh, still Mulk, uh, his uh, half-sister, who took over the reign as a regent to take care of the preparation of her nephew to assume the caliph role. And it is perhaps during this period that Ibn al-Haytham would have started resurfacing into public life and also uh, earning his own upkeep uh, from his own efforts in copying manuscripts of uh, Euclid's elements and manuscripts of uh, Al-Majest uh, of Ptolemy. And in a sense, uh, uh, receiving rem remunerations that would have been able to sustain him. And in this sense, he would have been detached from the dependence on a patronage such as the one he would have received at a certain point under the Fatimid Caliph. And uh, the remunerations that he received, at least according to the sources, indicate that he would have lived comfortably, given that the copies that would have received his hand in being retraced of the Euclid uh, element and the Ptolemy's Al-Majest would have been very re reliable, given the skills and the capabilities uh, that he had demonstrated as a geometer and astronomer. Now we move to the main uh, context in terms of uh, focusing on one aspect of, of his legacy, which is the theme of the talk, which is the science of optics. The science of optics comes mainly from a monumental treatise that he has composed. We don't know exactly at what time, but most likely after the time of the death of Al-Hakim bi Amrillah. And that treatise, has been supported also by several other epistles or smaller studies in optics around uh, his conceptions of physical light, its propagation, and aspects that relate to the dioptrics. But on the whole, the, the bulk of his contribution in the science of optics was in the monumental treatise that carries the title Kitabul Manadr, which is usually translated in English as the Book of Optics, but in the Latin renditions of the text, it is referred to sometimes as the perspectiva, at others as the aspectibus. And in later points, when it was printed in Latin in Europe, it was uh, under the heading of optica. But in general, it could be rendered in a literal sense as the book of sceneries or the book of um, uh, appearances or visualizations. This book, consists of seven discourses or maqalat, 
Each is a volume on its own and quite lengthy and complicated in terms of the nature of the material it deals with. Volumes one to two deal with direct vision, which is not at that point mediated by any instrument, whether it is a polished surface like a mirror or looking through something that is akin to a lens. So it is direct vision as uh, it unfolds in immediate visual perception. Book uh, three or the volume three uh, deals with the errors of direct vision. And that's where the uh, Ibn al-Haytham develops a cognitive psychology uh, of vision or a philosophy of mind. And then the books um, or volumes four to six deal with catoptrics, uh, which is the branch uh, of uh, optics that studies the reflection of light and its instruments as mirrors or polished surfaces. And he does this on various sections uh, that stand as modelings of mirrors, uh, whether they are sections of the cylinder, the cone, or the sphere. Then comes uh, uh, the uh, last uh, component of Kitab al Manadir, which is dealing with dioptrics and constitutes volume seven. And this is uh, a branch in optics that deals with the refraction of light and its instruments as modeled lenses. And again, he would use in this uh, not just random uh, sections for the, what can be a geometric modeling of lenses, but they are sections derived from. Uh, the cone, the cylinder, uh, and the sphere in their concave and convex uh, uh, properties or attributes. Now, uh, Kitab al uh, in the uh, theory of direct vision presents us with a novel intromission account of visual perception. And in this, Ibn al Haytham departs from the received knowledge that comes from the lineage of what he refers to as the mathematicians, and therefore those who are uh, 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 Im impacted by the reception of the tradition of Euclid and Ptolemy in optics, who advocated an extra mission or emission theory of vision. That's one group. He distinguishes himself from them and also distinguishes himself from the natural philosophers of the Aristotelian tradition who held an intromission theory or thesis of vision. If we take the case of the mathematicians of the Euclidean uh, Ptolemaic tradition and their extramission theory, they held that ultimately vision occurs by way of the emission from the eyes of rays of light that are non-consuming, so they don't burn, so they have a subtlety to them, but they are fiery in character, so they belong to the element of fire. They come out from the eyes in the shape of a cone of vision. The vertex of the cone is in the center of the eye and its surfaces intersect with the objects in the ambient environment. The Aristotelian thesis states the, in a sort of an inverted understanding of vision that involves intromission. So I see things because of the visible forms of the object of vision being transmitted in a medium such as air, which is a transparent medium that is actualized as a transmitter of visible forms when itself it is illuminated. So in a sense, a given space that has a body of air that is in the dark if I bring into it a candle, that body of air within that room has been illuminated, and then the air becomes at that point actualized in its capacity to transmit the visible forms of the objects within that room for them to hover in a way to enter into the eyes. Ibn al Haytham was not satisfied with the thesis of the Euclidean Ptolemaic mathematicians of extramission, nor was he uh, accepting the ambiguities uh, in the approach to intromission that he found in the Aristotelian natural philosophy. So his approach was to adopt an intromission theory 
that tells us that ultimately I see things by way of the introduction into my eyes of rays of light that are coming from the outer lit visible surfaces of the opaque objects of vision facing my eyes in such a way that these rays of light propagate in a rectilinear fashion in an isotropic homogeneous transparent medium such as air and that they enter into the eye in a way that they converge within it in the shape of a cone of vision that has um, uh, its vertex at the center of the eye and its surfaces intersecting with the visible lit surfaces of the opaque objects of vision facing the observer. Now, this thesis that he's presenting is based on his attempt in a general epistemic move to geometrize the notions of natural philosophy, to mathematize physics. And he states it explicitly as the basis upon which he will conduct his inquiries. And his investigations are done through experimental control testing that happens at different degrees of verification and control up to the point of designing special architectural installations for him to conduct the experiment and derive from it observational data that are within his control. Now, within that context of geometrizing physics and subjecting the phenomena to be studied to an experimental control testing environment, he comes up with a model that gives us an explanation as to how we sense things from the external environment via the agency of rays of light that are emitted from these entities and enter into the eyes. Let us take an example. I take a surface that is uh, represented here in a section uh, a diagram that has a point A and a point B on it. This is a surface that is lit and visible of a given object of vision. From point A, there's an irradiation of light in every direction spherically. And the same from point B. This means that if my eye is facing this object and its lit visible surface AB, there are innumerable, almost uncountable number of rays of light that are descending from every point on the surface AB onto my eyes. So let us take, for instance, from A, there are multiple rays of light that are coming from A and hitting my eye and hitting it in the sense that they have actual physical sensing. They have a tactile character to it. So there is something tactile, which is a corpuscule of fire coming from the lit visible object and coming and touching my eye. Out of all of these, he isolates only those who fall orthogonally onto the eye, because these are the ones that fall in a perpendicular, in a normal, in such a way that they will pass through all the transparent uh, membranes in the frontal part of the eye. So they pass in a straight line. The rest are for him are to be bracketed. They are refracted, reflected, but only a single ray of light that is coming from A comes at a normal at the eye. And this is the one that needs to be accounted for in terms of constituting this cone of vision. All the body of all of these rays of light at orthogonals descending onto the center of the eye. Now, they pass through the transparent layers of the eye, these, until they reach the crystalline. And he has done a whole study that is based on the science of anatomy. Uh, evidently, in his time, it can't be done on a human beings. So it is by simulation, possibly some said potentially a horse or a cow, but these are speculations. 
So these rays of light are descending at an orthogonal now. They pass through the transparent membrane of the eye and across the crystalline. Once they hit the divider between the crystalline and the vitreous humor, they refract. And by refracting, they retain the same arrangement they had. Because if they have continued in an orthogonal, you know, rectilinear way, they would have intersected hypothetically at the center of the eye and resulted in something like a camera obscura phenomenon, an inversion of the, uh, of the visible form of the object of vision. But he tells us that he's fully aware of the camera obscura, he uses it, he develops all the mathematics that gives an explanation as to the principle according to which it works. So he's fully aware that the eye, when it receives the physical light within its uh, multiple layers, uh, as these lights pass from the crystalline humor to the vitreous humor, they refract and therefore retain the same arrangement without inversion of the arrangement on the visible uh, lit surface of the object of vision. Now, in this process, he uh, develops um, in books uh, one and two, or these discourses or volumes one and two of Kitab or Manadar, this theory uh, of intromission. But it doesn't stop at this level. The crystalline itself and the vitreous are no longer considered by him at this stage as being simply um, uh, a sort of refractive devices. They're not simply entities that give us an explanation of the refraction of light. They are also sensing organs. And the sensations are simply the impress of physical light that has a fiery quality to it on the eye. And it's an arrangement of sensations. The more intense the light in the external environment where this ray of light is coming from, the more sensation we have. So it's an arrangement of a neurological phenomenon. He calls it the uh, a link to the al-asaba al-jawfa, the optic nerves. So the sensations now pass from the vitreous and the filaments of the optic nerve in each of the eyes as neurological sensations that get um, um, regathered in the common nerve, splintered again, and then reaching um, a last sentient in the frontal part of the brain. So the geometrized physics of light, as it is explained against the, an anatomy of uh, the eye that takes the eye to be constituted of a series of um, refractive uh, lenses is now translated into a neurological cerebral um, analysis of how vision occurs. But the last sensation happens in this frontal part of the brain in between the two eyes, somewhere here. Now, that sensation in the last sentient, al-hasul akhir, the analysis beyond it becomes an analysis that is psychological. That's where he establishes uh, his, the main rudiments of his psychology of vision or his philosophy of mind in uh, the treatment of the errors of vision. Errors of vision are not only due to physical conditions of the propagation of light, nor to the healthiness, physiological and neurological of the eyes and the optical nervous system or the brain, but also in the manner the faculties themselves come to understand, judge, recognize, imagine, and remember what they have seen in the ambient environment in previous occasions. So it is a cognitive also basis for visual perception. There is an added layer to this where vision is not only um, linked to um, the cognitive process as it is dependent only on the eyes and the optic nerves and the brain, but also on the fact that the eyes are carried through within a full embodiment. 
So in a sense, you know, the fact that I could turn my neck, lift it and move around, I am in my actual embodiment, in my actual being in the flesh as a body, also invested in the process of establishing the possibilities for me having a proper visual perception rather than one that is prone to error. So here he goes even further into a theory of embodiment that underpins his cognitive psychology, which is fascinating because these kinds of uh, aspects have great resonances in much later traditions uh, in philosophy and in cognate sciences that develop from the philosophical disciplines, including psychology. And it's linked now with kinesthetic embodiment as a context in which visual perception also unfolds. I mentioned that when he studied um, uh, the conditions for understanding the behavior of light, in particular, he relied on experiments. He enacted many of them, and some of them required very complex uh, geometric uh, um, uh, articulations of the architectural installations in such a way that they meet the conditions of control under which the experiment is going to be conducted. Like for instance, all of this model is developed to have a wooden uh, cuboid that is pierced with um, um, a, a sort of cylindrical opening that is uh, here perpendicular to two of its uh, parallel surfaces versus another one that is inclined as represented here. One that is uh, rectilinear straight, the other one is inclined here. And this, this space here is receiving direct sunlight. This one is not the receiving direct sunlight. And he designs this installation to show that there is an emission of secondary accidental light from the lit surface that is receiving sunlight that itself gives off light that enters in a rectilinear fashion through these apertures and is observed within the camera obscura. This is just one example of multiple other experimental installations that he devises even to ascertain through observation uh, the nature of the optical phenomenon that he is studying. And this was fundamental ultimately for, for even his uh, understanding of the behavior of light uh, regarding um, how it passes, for instance, with uh, diopter, diopters uh, or a refractive instrument such as a sphere of glass filled of water placed into a camera obscura and subjected to light in a controlled manner and observing the behavior of light as it passes through the glass through the water and then exits through the glass and the water back into the air. Another installation, for instance, that he devises has resonances with the, um, what we later witness in the Ames room. Let me just describe the first installation that he devises. He constructs an architectural setting where we have two rooms. There's the experimental room and the room where observers can come into and move out from. Within the experimental room, he places two screens or walls. They are, not, they are not at equal distance from the aperture that is pierced through this wall. And he asks the observers to determine the distance of uh, W1 and W2, while they cannot see the ceiling nor the ground. And he varies the conditions of illumination and also the coloring of these screens. And he observes that at times under certain variations of the conditions of looking through the aperture, sometimes they mistook W2 for being closer uh, than W1 to them. And at times they took them to be one and the same wall. Now, by eliminating the screen between the two spaces, they immediately realize because of the existence at least of the shared ground between them and these two walls, that ultimately W1 is uh, much closer to them than W2. Now, uh, if you recall the Ames room, it plays on an optical illusion similar to this kind of aperture, but here there is a modification of the space. When you look through the aperture, you think it is a kind of cuboid, whereby this surface that is here at the end of the space 
is uh, taken through the observation as if it is parallel to the wall that carries the aperture. But in reality, this corner is much shorter in height than this corner. And this corner, it's much deeper in the room at a distance from the aperture than this one. And here we see this optical illusion. And because the fact that we have here two human beings, it is immediately recognized by us cognitively that what we are seeing here is an optical illusion, even though the architecture gives us the semblance of being otherwise. But if I have put here a cylinder that is in orange and another cylinder that is yellow here, and I don't know the size of the orange cylinder versus the yellow cylinder, and I look through the aperture, there's nothing that indicates to me at that point that this is an optical illusion. All I say is I see a room that has two cylinders, one orange and one yellow. And the fact that Ibn al-Haytham did this experiment without the human beings or use of objects that we know by familiarity how to classify them, uh, indicates also the, the level of abstraction in the experiment that he intended, which can fool more uh, the observer and therefore detects more the conditions of the error of vision rather than just uh, doing an entertaining exercise um, of uh, devising a context for an optical illusion. Now, this, um, this aspect related to his uh, focus on embodiment in the manner when I move around, I, uh, I disclose in space time the various facets of the object of vision that faces me. So if, for instance, if I'm carrying a cube, even in my own hand, there's no way whatsoever but for me to see three of its sides only at one time. I have to rotate it in my own hand to see the other side, or I place it on a table in, or somewhere where it is a surface that is transparent so that I could see the other sides that this cube has by turning around it. And in doing so, what I was seeing as I rotate the cube becomes veiled and what was veiled becomes unveiled. And he's very aware of this concealment, unconcealment that is involving our immersion in the context in which we see by way of kinesthetic acts. We move and the objects of vision move. And according to this, we need some kind of a terrain that is common between us and the objects of vision that is ordered and has contiguities in its parts that allows us to judge with greater accuracy their size, uh, their location, uh, their position, and at times their shape. Now, this theory of space that is invested in embodiment is also complemented by another theory that he develops in a separate treatise in which he establishes that um, ultimately, um, uh, 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 place, the place of something, topos or al-makan, uh, is akin to a uh, extension uh, or something that uh, is uh, more of the order of a postulated void that exists between the inner surfaces uh, of, the, uh, of the object. So in a sense, um, uh, the place of the sphere is the expansion, extension spatial that is between the inner uh, surfaces, uh, sorry, the point uh, on its inner surfaces. So it is a three-dimensional space. And this he needed to do to remove the dominance of uh, the definition of topos that we find in the physics of Aristotle in book Delta. Because according to Aristotle, uh, the topos of something uh, is uh, determined as the innermost surface of the container that is in touch with the outermost surface of the contained. So if I take this body of water inside the glass, it's the inner surface of the glass that is in touch with the outer surface of the water within the body of the cup and the um, um, inner surface of the body of the air that is in the outer 
in touch with the outer surface of the water. So it is ultimately from a quantification perspective, when I want to determine the magnitude of the place of an object, I have to determine the total surface area of that object. And this is the Aristotelian definition. One example that Ibn al-Haytham offers is a demonstration that the sphere is the largest amongst uh, isoepiphanic uh, uh, entities. So it is the largest amongst uh, uh, solids that have equal surface areas. So if I take the cylinder here and the sphere, if they have equal surface areas, this means that the sphere contains material uh, more than the cylinder and the sphere is larger than the cylinder. This incongruity between the magnitude of the place of something and the actual magnitude of an object was not accepted by Ibn al-Haytham. And he tries to um, demonstrate through this that two objects that are um, unequal in size, according to Aristotle's definition, can occupy places that are equal in size. And this is one amongst many other demonstrations that he uses to uh, do away with Aristotle's definition of topos in natural philosophy that, uh, aspects of physics. And here he brings an understanding of place, Ibn al-Haytham brings an understanding of place as a postulated geometric void that determines a, a spatial extension for conducting the demonstrations and descriptive work and projections in geometry. So this is part and parcel of his effort also to geometrize the notions of uh, natural philosophy. Um, I have given the details of his uh, of the main aspects of his uh, of his oeuvre, and now I'll move a little bit into some aspects of its reception and lines of transmission. The work itself was translated within the circles of potentially uh, uh, Gerard of Cremona in the 12th century in Toledo. This is the translation into Latin. It makes its way uh, possibly through Paris to figures like Roger Bacon from the Franciscan um, College at Oxford in the 13th century. So at the time of the establishment of Oxford, there's these Franciscan monks who are so fascinated with optics. And one of the major uh, contributions in this regard is uh, presented through the Opus Maius of Roger Bacon in a, a whole volume that he describes under the heading Perspectiva, where there is a direct, direct uh, uh, reliance on the optics of Ibn al-Haytham in its Latin translation. There is also John Packham and Vitello within the same kind of order, and especially Vitello from the Polish tradition that becomes so fascinated with writing commentaries almost line by line in Latin on the Latin trans, uh, translation of Ibn al-Haytham. And um, this tradition continues. It reaches uh, Theodoric of Freiburg in the 14th century. And what is fascinating about Theodoric of Freiburg is that he is so fixated on writing a recensions of the conception of color in the optics of Ibn al-Haytham based on a new interpretation of the phenomenon of the rainbow. And he does so in the 14th century in the same time frame when Kamal al-Din farisi works on the same question in, uh, in Persia, in Iran, within the Maragha institution. Ibn, uh, Kamal al-Din farisi in the 14th century is working on an Arabic version of the optics of Ibn al-Haytham, while Theoderic of Freiburg is working in the 14th century uh, uh, within the Dominican order uh, on uh, the Latin uh, translation of the optics of Ibn al-Haytham. Now, very basic, just so that give you just a hint about where the difference happens, is that uh, Ibn al-Haytham would have been focused more on the body of the cloud of mist as a reflective, refractive uh, instrument uh, through which the rainbow arises as a visual phenomenon. While Theoderic of Freiburg and Kamal al-Din al-Farisi are more focused on the single rain droplet in double reflection, double refraction as 
constituting the basis upon which we would understand the, uh, uh, the rise of the spectrum of color in the rainbow. And according to both of them, they came to the statement that ultimately uh, color is none other than a phenomenon of light. While in Ibn al-Haytham, there is a suggestion that it could be a phenomenon of light or a phenomenon that accompanies accidental secondary light that is emitted from opaque um, lit surfaces of object of vision and namely uh, entities that give light that, is, are, that are not self-luminous. And they both in simulating the rain droplet in the context of an experimental work They both rely on the study that Ibn al-Haytham has done on the burning sphere or on the sphere taken as an entity that acts as a reflective, but more so as a refractive uh, uh, instrument when it is studied uh, in the context of a camera obscura. Um, the tradition of the transmission of uh, Ibn al-Haytham's uh, text in its Latin version is much more widely spread than what we find with the dissemination of the Arabic text um, in the Islamicate context. So the tradition of the optics of Ibn al-Haytham as it was also mediated via these uh, um, commentaries that it received from the time it was translated up to the Florentine Italian Renaissance finds its way to the uh, context of uh, the work of uh, Leon Battista Alberti in the De Pictura, or the treatise on painting, where he devises a mathematical model that is somehow an abstraction uh, of the, uh, of the uh, representation in geometric diagrammatic form of the cone of vision and using this as a basis to guide the painter and architect in establishing a more accurate way of rendering uh, the visible spatial depth. Uh, so the rise of the perspectiva artificialis based on the optical perspectiva naturalis. And we see also an impress on Lorenzo Ghiberti in the Commentario Terzo where Ghiberti works also on the Vulgari, on the Italian version of the Latin version of Ibn al-Haytham. And uh, uh, Batista, uh, Leone Battista Alberti focuses more on the geometric modeling uh, aspects that could guide perspective. Lorenzo Ghiberti focuses more on the cognitive investment in, in the manner we have visual cues when we look at things. And we cannot uh, consider, according to Lorenzo Ghiberti, only the eye as fixed in a single point because it vibrates and there is the movement of the embodied observer. So both take a section or part of the optics of Ibn al-Haytham to establish two parallel traditions in devising perspectiva. And we see this debate is very important in the Renaissance over who could perfect uh, perspectival projection. Um, the Latin text of Ibn al-Haytham, and this aspect of perspective continues further, but the Latin text has another trajectory. It falls into the hands of the mathematician um, uh, who was at the time, you know, sponsored by the, uh, by the, uh, by the French. Um, um, uh, it's uh, Friedrich Reisner. So in the 16th century, we have the printed uh, Latin version of Ibn al-Haytham in its entirety. Till today, we don't have the full text in Arabic printed. So this gives you an idea that, you know, in the Latin uh, context, the text was in wide circulation from uh, the printing time, uh, 1572, in Basel, uh, where the printing happens. And there are lots of studies now that suggest uh, that figures such as Kepler, Huygens, Descartes, Snellius uh, have consulted uh, this work. We see then a researchers resurging of the perspectiva tradition, again in a milieu of architecture through the work of uh, 
uh, Francois d'Aiguillon, here within the Jesuit school of Antwerp, a Jesuit school of mathematics, that is also invested in studies in optics. And here it's again an architect investing in this uh, course of investigation. And we see some beautiful vignettes, and this is, we're talking about 17th century. We see beautiful vignettes done by, by Rubens, the Flemish Baroque uh, famous painter, and they represent reconstructions of various um, experiments that are similar to, for instance, this one to the one that I showed you in a cross section to determine the propagation in a rectilinear fashion of light, for instance, here. So there's this single hole and two lamps and showing ultimately that even though the rays of light are passing through the, the same hole here and they cross each other, they do not intermix and they continue in a rectilinear fashion. Another one, as I told you when we were talking about the dissection of the eye, and then I talked about the, the last sentient in the frontal part of the brain. So we see here the muses or angels aiding the experimenter, the researcher who's the, conducting the anatomy or the experiment. These are focused very much on the eye and its physiology, while there's another one here conversing with another angel, beautiful narrative saying, no, no, don't just focus almost on anatomy and physiology. Think also of the cerebral aspects. This is the main sensing organ. All of these are instruments to lead to this sensation in the brain. And other aspects that relate here to the parallax uh, studies, which we find a tablet similar to this, described in five experimental contexts in the optics of Ibn al-Haytham. And the tradition continues to unfold through the opticorum uh, uh, of Francois de Guillon. We have an impress on Gérard Desargues uh, in a context where there is a great investment in refining perspectiva more on a mathematical basis that is much more advanced than what we find before the time of Gérard Desargues and using it also in part as part and parcel of perfecting the arts of masonry, which happened at the time in the effort to increase the re reliability of fortification against the development of higher techniques of cannon ballistics uh, in that context. So um, it's the use of these techniques in, uh, in, in optics, to further develop the, the quality even of uh, engineering. And this is a, a fundamental shift that later on translates into the Ecole Polytechnique that are you know, the type that developed into Pont et Chaussé into, into engineering applied sciences. Another uh, aspect to the tradition finds its way from another side where the optics of Ibn al-Haytham has fed into his astronomy, and in particular here into selenography, the study of the moon. And what I find fascinating about Johannes Hevelius <coughs> is like, unlike Galileo, unlike Copernicus, um, unlike perhaps even Descartes, he is very much uh, a, honest about the uh, traditions in science that helped shape his, his new branch of uh, astronomy in Selenographia. Here, he uh, gives credit to his contemporary Galileo by making him stand on the pedestal of sensation or sensu, observation, evidently done through a, an instrument that is not of the invention of Galileo, but of the fabrication of Galileo. He puts it together and it is used originally and at start in the Padua context for military purposes. And then we see here, which is, I find in Hevelius, a sort of a penchant about disclosing his sources, which is remarkable for the context in which he was operating, where he places on the pedestal of Ratione al-Hazen, 
So crediting here, not a contemporary, but someone who came 600 years before his time from a totally different culture uh, and crediting him for establishing the basis of the discipline that is now mathematized. And to symbolize this, he shows us a geometric diagram with a compass, with a compass. And uh, the, the tradition of working on Ibn al-Haytham continues to unfold in different uh, avenues, including mm, this year, it has been a very fruitful year in terms of finding ways to disclose more of the niceties of his system by interacting, as I said, with, with colleagues from multiple disciplines and from actual scientists practicing in physics and uh, experimental psychology besides other, other uh, domains that touch upon the, the humanities. And uh, thank you very much uh, you know, for giving me the chance to share with you uh, this presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Nadir. It is a pleasure for us, and we are also very excited about this work in which you are also starting, I guess, to uh, expertise on him this year, right? Um, I've, I've done uh, a lot of work before, but I'm trying to bring it now to bear more mm. on, on, yeah, I've, I've done huh? significant amount of work on its tradition. <laughs> And actually, I had the, the great opportunity to share some earlier aspects of this mm. uh, in other forums, including in the Azarkil uh, school that we held in, uh, in Sicily. Can I make yes, a comment? Yes. Sure. yes, please. Can I make a comment, please? Yes. Uh, you hear me? Yes, yes. sure. Yeah. Actually, uh, Hi, Nader. Well, I happy to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Nader combined optics with philosophy, and this is amazing. I mean, he has such a language, which I cannot really. Uh, I admire this language he is using to make this connection. So, and I, I want actually to say that this uh, lecture shows that the scientific method has been transferred to Europe mainly through Ibn al-Haytham. And this was the, the work of not the Arabic only, the work of the Osmanic, Turkish, and uh, Iranian, and the Arab people together. This was a kind of Naza, okay? And this is uh, the history of the culture is actually a transfer of knowledge from one nation or group to the other. And therefore, actually, we should be proud about that in this East. And this is the Azarqui Az 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 School. Thank you for your comment. And I must say, this tradition that leaves an impress in Maraha reaches eventually 16th century Taqiyuddin ibn Ma'roof in Istanbul, so yes. in the Ottoman yes. court. Yes. But as mediated by a Kamaluddin Farisi. Um, the aspect that I highlighted is that um, it remains a sort of desideratum that we complete the, the, the original, which is mainly manuscripts that are in Istanbul, right? They are in Sulaymaniye and Topkapi. So to base on this, to finalize the work, given that um, uh, it was printed in its full version at the time when the printing press was starting. So this indicates to you, um, um, you know, the, uh, the developments that are happening in the European context already see that this treatise merits uh, in the rise of printing press to be one of the first amongst other foundational works in science to be printed. Yeah, it amplifies how important it is, yes. Mm. It would be great to have you in person in Istanbul if you were able to do this uh, Ozarkia school in Istanbul again. But okay. unfortunately, it, these are difficult times, so yeah. maybe later again. 
tomorrow evening we have another professor from Turkey. He's also in history of science, um, Professor Yevuzunat. Maybe he knows more about those printed uh, or manuscripts in Suleymaniye. Uh, very interesting. Uh, they say, thank you. I'm just looking at the comments right now. One of our students also is uh, asking if you could share about the references, if you have a paper or something about this topic. Yes, I have. Um, let me see if I could put a couple of papers. Uh, maybe I have a couple of papers here. Maybe you can share later. I ah, will I'll share with the students. Okay, yes. That's better. So I'll, That's send, right. I'll send a couple of papers published by, you know, I published with Cambridge University Press. And also, um, 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 actually, uh, Maurizio, if you don't mind, um, the one with the European Journal of uh, Physics Plus. Ah, yeah. Can I send it, for instance? Of course. Yeah. 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 Why not? Yeah. That's right. a good okay. idea. Well, since since to to you you have uh, called me, I profit. I I ask uh, an excuse to everyone. I profit of the moment to send you greetings from my daughter, Lucia, <laughs> your <laughs> official <laughs> translator. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. She, she could not attend simply because she has a, a, an online meeting going on too. Uh, she is now in Birmingham, <laughs> so close to you more or less. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so greetings from Lucia. Please, uh convey also you know, my warm regards. <coughs> sure, sure. So yes, it would be great if you could share some references. If also you could um, suggest some books to the students also, which are interested, they are asking for it. <laughs> Where to start, maybe. <laughs> oh, your mic is off, sorry, Professor Nadi. Can you open your microphone? Yeah, Kitabul Manazar is available in part in English. Uh, this is uh, the volumes one to three, published by the Warburg Institute and translated by, by my mentor in a sense and professor who was at Harvard, uh, Abdul Hamid Sabr. Uh, so they exist, I could send it in the references. The, okay. the full Latin translation is available through this uh, Reisner uh, edition. And I think it can be downloaded, but it's Latin, all of it. Um, and I could send a couple of my own publications uh, rather than just listing, I could send you the PDF. Um, that would be great. Okay, thank you. A list of references would be, I think, uh, yes. a beginning. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let me check if you have any questions on YouTube as well. Okay. We have students here on Zoom and also some people watching on YouTube right now. Okay, uh, I believe that this would be a reference uh, um, video on YouTube, which will be also watched later on, with your permission, of course. And it will be open source uh, for many people who will be willing to do some research on Ibn al-Haytham or optics, maybe. Okay, it looks like though that's all for uh, the questions right now. I hope you will be well enough for tomorrow evening and joining us. We would have a very interesting discussion with you and another science, Minister of Science professor maybe with us. Uh, that would be really interesting, I believe. 
Uh, they could do that if you feel good, of course. It would be really nice to have you here among us tomorrow night as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Nader. It is so great to have you. you here, yes. Pleasure to see you tomorrow. Nice to meet you again. It's a great pleasure. So have a good evening, everyone. Yes, very yeah. nice work. I enjoy a lot. Thank you. Yeah, we Thank enjoy you. Good evening, a lot. Thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot for tonight's uh, talk. And Thank you very much, Professor. Yes. We'll you. see you tomorrow again. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye.